uh, everyone. Uh, this is Eva Lenola from the OECD, and I think we'll get uh, started just with my introduction here. We had about 40 people pre-register for the, the webinar, so hopefully we'll have a, a few more people join um, in the next few minutes. Um, if I can just ask you to please, if you're not speaking, to mute your line. Uh, that will help with any uh, feedback or, or um, extraneous noise uh, on the on the WebEx so that we can all hear Kai well. Uh, so welcome to this uh, OECD uh, UN Environment Global PFC Group uh, webinar. Uh, for those of you that um, maybe are the first time tuning in to one of these uh, webinars, uh, the, OD, the, the group uh, supports the SICOM resolutions on uh, PFASs and shifting to safer alternatives and also sharing information, including uh, risk management uh, approach information uh, on PFASs. So, I'm get, I'm, yeah, so as you join, if you could please uh, mute your lines and that will help with the, the, the sound, uh, sound quality. Um, so uh, today uh, we have a webinar uh, by Kai Schubert from the Chemours Company. Thank you very much, uh, Kai, for being willing to um, do this webinar on best environmental practices uh, for the for the textile sector. So Kai will uh, give his presentation, and then we'll have a Q and A uh, session with the, the participants following. Uh, the presentation. Uh, and just before I turn things over to Kai, um, just like to uh, let people that are online know that if you do have ideas for webinars for the OECD unit uh, group, uh, you're welcome to send those ideas to the OECD Secretariat. Um, and also, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Marianne uh, Boche and uh, Christiana Oladini James, who have uh, helped put this uh, webinar together uh, today. And um, I guess just as, a, as an advanced uh, advertisement, um, on October 30th, we'll be holding um, another webinar on. Uh, uh, which is entitled Toward Greener Water and Oil, Oil Repellents in the Textiles Industry. Uh, and this is a case study from the Mid-War Life uh, Project looking at the mitigation of environmental imp impacts of durable water and oil repellents used in textile finishing. So uh, we'll have some information on the OECD uh, website or you've received an email if you're part of the, of the, the group um, uh, for that webinar on the 30th. Uh, but now I'd like to uh, turn things over to uh, Kai uh, for his presentation. So please go ahead, Kai. Great. Uh, thank you, Eva, for for the kind uh, introduction and for the invitation to uh, to present uh, in this uh, in this forum. Also, thank you to Marianne and uh, Christiana that uh, helped uh, organize the event and helped me to to get ready so that uh, hopefully this WebEx will will run smoothly without uh, without any problems. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I hope you can see my presentation. And uh, of course, I thank the participants for, for joining as well. And I'm, I'm looking forward to a, to a good discussion. Uh, we can, we, you can wait with questions until the end. But if there's something that is urgent, uh, please uh, feel free to interrupt me and, and ask a question uh, when, uh, when, when you have one. Uh, just as a, as a background, so I'm, I work for the Comores Company, but uh, today I'm representing Flora Council uh, in this presentation. So uh, I will start off with giving you a little bit of background uh, about the Flora Council, and then we will start uh, looking into the details on best environmental practices for, for textiles. So about the Flora Council, if you have not uh, heard about them, uh, you, can, you can check out, uh, of course, their, their website. I, I give the link here. Uh, in, in my presentation is an, uh, is an industry association that uh, represents the world's uh, leading manufacturers of what we call fluorotechnology. And fluorotechnology uh, for us means uh, fluoropolymers, uh, fluoroelastomers, and fluorotelomer-based products. And uh, today's presentation uh, will be associated with the fluorotelomer-based uh, products that are, that are used in the textile uh, value chain. Floral Council currently has uh, six uh, member companies, uh, Acroma, Arkema, AGC, Daikin, Solvay, and Camours, 
but has and has also two associate members. Uh, those are Dynex and Tyco Fire. And uh, what I indicated here on this slide is the, the, the these four stars here. They indicate that uh, these Flora Council members are also Blue Sign System partners. Uh, this will become important uh, later on, but I just wanted to call it out here that uh, these member companies are, are part of the Blue Sign uh, system. Uh, Flora Council's focus is uh, to work with regulators uh, to facilitate the global transition from long-chain substances like PFOA or long-chain-based uh, fluorotelomer-based products uh, to more sustainable alternatives. Uh, we are supporting science and risk-based regulatory outcomes uh, to facilitate this uh, transition, and we are supporting end-use market access uh, to fluorotechnology that brings unique and critical benefits to, uh, to all of us. So when we, when we then make the switch and, and focus on, on the textile industry, uh, as I said earlier, fluorotelomer-based products are used in the textile industry because they provide a durable oil, water, and stain repellency. And uh, this is of importance in, in several sectors. Uh, most likely, we know those applications from apparel. When you look at uh, raincoats, for example, uh, or, or outdoor equipment, uh, that is uh, usually treated with uh, <clears throat> some type of uh, repellent, typically for the high-performance uh, uh, equipment and, and jackets, for example, or, or gear. Uh, this is uh, uh, treated with fluorinated uh, substances to give it a durable water and stain repellency, including oil repellency, but it's not limited to that use. There's also uses in, in upholstery, for example, where you want to protect the fabric of expensive furniture or you want to extend the life uh, of furniture in, in public places. Uh, for that, you would need to have, of course, uh, more abrasion-resistant uh, finishes uh, because those are heavily used, uh, like is indicated here, chairs, for example, in waiting rooms or car seats. Uh, there's applications for military, for firefighters, and for the police. Uh, those are, I would say, workwear uh, protective uh, uh, finishes that help with, uh, with safety. And uh, also an important aspect here is uh, an application for hospital gowns, uh, drapes, and, and divider curtains. Uh, those are treated uh, typically with fluorinated uh, or fluorotelomer-based uh, substances to provide uh, protection against the spread of infectious diseases uh, in hospitals, for example. So there's a broad range of, uh, of applications uh, for this, this chemistry. And uh, when you look, when we look, take a deeper look in how do these things work, and this is not really a detailed look, it's more of a cartoonish type look, is what is the structure of these uh, side chain fluorinated polymers that, uh, that give that uh, performance? Is you, you have a, a polymer backbone that is not fluorinated, and you uh, attach basically to that backbone uh, other monomers that are not fluorinated that give functionality but also could give uh, anchoring to, uh, to the substrate that you want to treat. And then you have sprinkled in, so to say, uh, fluorinated monomers that have fluorinated side chains that are six carbons long. And as you can see here in, in this cartoon, the, the side chains that are sticking out to give the performance, they are not all fluorinated. And I think that sometimes uh, uh, what we read in, in the literature is it, it makes it sound that this is a heavily fluorinated uh, polymer, that is, but it's not necessarily the case. And nowadays, the key functionality uh, is provided, as I mentioned already, uh, by what we call short-chain uh, telomer-based uh, chemistry, so the, the fluorinated carbon chain length is 6, that has replaced uh, the long-chain uh, chemistry with the uh, 8 carbons. And uh, just as a reminder, uh, this is the chemistry, uh, the long-chain chemistry is a chemistry that is no longer practiced. Uh, by floral council members uh, since 2000 <coughs> or before. But what is also uh, important to note here, and this is in the bottom of the slide, is that these uh, substances also uh, contain very small amounts of unreacted raw materials and impurities, and uh, those are of course uh, also important of importance when we when we are focusing on on best environmental practices, for example. Uh, for the uh, a different view, I would say, for the for the audience that is uh, more interested in, in chemistry. I 
put a table up that uh, is uh, published in, uh, in many places. I, and, and by the way, throughout my presentation at the bottom, I usually give, uh, uh, give the reference for where you can find more information or where I took a certain information from. So from this slide, this is uh, based on a publication by Bob Buck et al. that was published in 2011. It's an open access uh, journal article on uh, uh, the uh, classification and terminology of uh, PFAS. Uh, you're welcome to download a copy if you don't have one. But you can also look at the OECD synthesis paper that this group uh, published in 2013 and that is also available as a PDF file uh, on, the, on the web, on the uh, PFAS, uh, or Global PFAS Group website uh, to download so you can see this, uh, this table. So what we're focusing on today is when we're talking about uh, the fluorotechnology that is used in textile finishes, we're talking about side chain fluorinated polymers. And in particular, those can be fluorinated acrylates or methacrylates polymers or fluorinated urethane polymers. This is chemistry that is practiced by Fluoro Council members, but they can also be fluorinated uh, oxetane polymers, and I believe that uh, this chemistry is not practiced by Fluoro Council members, but by companies uh, other than, uh, than uh, the members of the Fluoro Council. As I said earlier, these are uh, based on fluorotelomer-based uh, derivatives, and there could be impurities in the final product that is based, for example, on, on raw materials that is coming out of this, uh, uh, this uh, raw material uh, supply chain. And in addition, uh, in the process of making uh, fluorotelomers, you're, you're, you're creating a perfluoro a carboxylic acids, uh, for example, as, uh, as impurities. So the, uh, in, in the short chain fluorotelomer substances, you would expect to see, uh, for example, PFHXA, the perfluorohexanoic acid, as a, as a potential impurity present uh, in, in those uh, substances. So that was my introductory part to, to set the stage about what, uh, what Floral Council is and, and the chemistry that is associated uh, with this. And now I want to start going into the best environmental practices and uh, the heart of, of my presentation. I want to take the key messages of this presentation away early on, and then we, can, uh, then we can dig in and look at all these details. So best environmental practices cover an important aspect in the textile supply chain they play a central part or need to play a central part in improving environmental impacts and the sustainability of textiles overall. But what is also important to note is that this is only one part of, of the story, so to say, and uh, one part alone does not make a difference. And I, I try to, to make a picture out of that so we can all better understand. And what I came up with is if you want to make a raincoat, for example, you cannot uh, make that out of one piece. Right? You, you need to have a pattern to, to sew this together. Then you would uh, select a fabric, and then you have the different pieces that you would then cut out and then uh, sew together to make that raincoat. And, and BEP, or Best Environmental Practices, in my view, are only one piece of this, of this whole. So if you're only improving the best environmental practices for one particular chemistry, uh, then you are not ending up with a with a system that is improved overall. So you would get a raincoat that is incomplete, so to say, would not, would not protect you of, uh, of the environment. So what is really needed is what, what, what is called system change, and industry uh, or the value chain in textile has adopted that as a, as, a, as, a, as a term to say system change is key, and we see that is happening. I will show you uh, some examples, uh, but there's also a lot of room for improvement but the industry is as well on a path on, uh, on making improvements every year. So system changes to coordinate key inputs uh, for sustainable improvement. So many different pieces need to fall into place and fit together nicely to then make this, this raincoat work at the end. So let's, let's start out on a, on a high level on, uh, for our best environmental practices, and then uh, we, we dig uh, into, into the matter deeper. So when, when we, all, we all know apparel, we all wear it every day, and uh, so we're all part, of, so to say, of, of creating this environmental uh, footprint or helping to create it. And uh, when you look at the life cycle, 
or the different life cycle stages for textiles, typically it starts out with a fiber selection. It could be uh, fibers, uh, natural fibers like cotton. We could uh, look at the environmental impact of uh, growing cotton, or you could say, we, I, I don't like cotton, I, I like more uh, synthetic, so you would look at the environmental impact of polyester or nylon, for example, or other natural or modified fibers like rayon, for example. Then you would, you would, would focus on the chemical selection to actually uh, turn the fibers into a fabric and then the pieces of apparel with, with the functionality that, that we want. So you, for that you need, of course, chemicals. And you need factories to process uh, th this to, to actually make that raincoat at the end. <clears throat> and in the last stage, we come into play, all of us, when we make a selection at the store to buy a certain piece of, uh, of garment or, or apparel. So we are, in principle, then buying that uh, uh, environmental impact that has been created by that piece. Uh, but that's not all, because then we take it home and we're using it. And oftentimes we're using it uh, uh, and then we, we launder it or we dry clean it, and that also has an impact on the environment. And then, of course, when we, uh, when we discard it at the end of life, uh, what are we doing with it? And so there's many different aspects here that, that are important that, that will create an impact. Uh, we are a central part of that, of course, but that's not, uh, not part of my presentation here today. I just want to focus on, on these two aspects here, the, the chemical selection, and of course the, the factories. When we when we look at the chemicals that are being discharged from from the textile industry, and this is a, a quote and and, a, and a, a figure that I took out of a recent report from the ZDHC group on the wastewater treatment technologies that was published not that long ago, as they say that uh, main sources with Severe pollution problems worldwide is, is textile industry effluent. And uh, when you look at the position of, of that effluent, you see there's a whole <laughs> of that, that is being uh, emitted and, and creating uh, uh, challenges for this uh, supply chain. You, you have, uh, I would say, a lot of inorganic uh, uh, loads that, that are put into the environment, like salt, soda ash, acids, uh, and caustics. Uh, but then you also have uh, organic material like softeners, enzymes, uh, dyes, uh, other chemicals, and soaping agents. And I would say, that since this is not further broken down, when we look at the fluorinated, uh, fluorinated polymers that are used to treat uh, apparel to make them, to render them water and oil repellent, uh, we would be falling here in the other category that, uh, that uh, we will be focusing on. So when we, I, I called this slide, couldn't find a better title, the leap from best environmental practices only to system change. So in my point of view, uh, 20 years ago, roughly 20 years ago, uh, the, the concerns around uh, best environmental practices uh, arose. There's, for example, a, a European Union Council directive to uh, have a more uh, integrated effort, I would say, around uh, pollution control and prevention, and, and groups were chartered to, to draft uh, reference documents for best available uh, techniques for different industries, and the textile industry is, is one of those industries that were selected. So in, in 2003, uh, a guideline for these best available techniques, including best environmental practices, was published, and it's a it's a book that is 626 pages long, so it's, uh, it's very comprehensive, uh, gives very, much, very great details, uh, but it's, it's published in the European Union languages and it might not be suited for a textile mill, for example, in, in Bangladesh or Pakistan or China or, or Vietnam or in other countries, because it might be way too complex to understand. But then I think the, not the, the industry evolved, but the value chain also evolved, and I would say since 2009 or 2010, we see an increased activity by many stakeholders to latch on to uh, the challenges in the textile uh, industry and the environmental impact that is being generated. And I put them into four different categories here, and I apologize if, uh, if I miss a category or 
or if certain organizations are not mentioned here. Uh, but I would start out with global policy organizations uh, like the, uh, the World Bank, uh, sponsored projects to, in, uh, to improve environmental performance in the textile supply chain, uh, UNEP and OECD uh, started to get involved. Uh, NGOs also started to get involved, uh, one in particular, uh, the Institute of uh, Public and Environmental Affairs in China, IPE, published uh, the water pollution map of China, where interested parties could go and take a look, uh, for example, if in their community which companies were in violation of their permit and, uh, and polluted uh, the environment more than, than what was allowed by, uh, by the authorities. But also uh, NRDC here in the U.S. Uh, started uh, to have uh, more efforts and concentrated efforts to help improve best environmental practices in the supply chain, and Greenpeace started uh, their detox campaign in 2011. So we have two big groups or, or categories that, that got involved, but also the apparel brands, retailers, mills, and suppliers started to come together and say, we, if we wanted to change something, it needs to be changed together, because if, if only one piece tries to make a change, it will be difficult. So the whole supply chain needs to come together. And, and those discussions, I would say, were initiated uh, by the Auto Industry Association here in the in the U.S., uh, that then teamed up with the European Auto Group (EOG) uh, to to develop uh, strategies and and uh, and plans around that. Uh, the Affirm Group uh, took a, a vital role, and then uh, later on, uh, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition was founded, and uh, also the ZDHC Group, the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals Group. So that, that, those came together in, in 2011, 2012 uh, timeframe to then start more looking into a system approach to a system change to get all players in the value chain together to implement and drive change. And what was also recognized then is that there's a need for third-party uh, certification to ensure that actually uh, progress is being made but also that third parties help to assess uh, chemicals and say which ones might be preferred versus uh, which ones might be restricted. And here I just call out uh, uh, two names. Uh, on later slides I have, uh, I have more, uh, more details. Uh, for example, Blue Sign Technologies and the Ecotex EcoPassport, for example, are those uh, third party uh, certifiers. So w when we put this all together, and say, how does uh, system change look like, or what are the enablers? I, I try to put different aspects here onto our, our pattern uh, that then, when we take all this uh, combined, we can make this uh, system change happen, and our raincoat will be, will be well sewed together and, uh, and uh, will be functioning. So one piece of, uh, that is critical that we need is best environmental practices uh, in, in the textile factories. Uh, Flora Council worked on developing those best environmental practices for the finishing operations to apply fluorinated polymers, and we will come to that uh, in, a, in a little bit. Uh, ZDHC, for example, worked on a manufacturer restricted substances list, basically creating a list of substances that are not allowed to, to be used or only uh, have limits to be allowed. And when you, when you take a look, I, I gave a, uh, the link here to, to the uh, manufacturer restricted substances list. You will see that this is a fairly long list of substances, of uh, organic substances. Uh, fluorinated substances are mentioned there as well, as, as I think three different categories, but the list is, very, is, is much longer and contains dyes and, and other hydrocarbon uh, based uh, chemicals. And then recently, uh, ZDHC uh, published the Wastewater Treatment uh, Technologies Guidelines uh, to help uh, textile mills and their performance for, uh, before they emit uh, wastewater uh, into the environment. And, and the fourth piece that, that, that tries to put it together and helps it uh, bond together is the HIG Index that helps us to benchmark and measure progress along the entire value chain. And if all this works together, I call the system change on the way to continuous improvement that will then help to create 
this uh, this whole system to uh, to improve environmental performance overall in the value chain. So let's let's focus first on uh, the best environmental practices, uh, the the, uh, the guidelines that that Flora Council developed, and then we will we will also uh, address uh, the other topics to show you that system change is working. So, as I said, Flora Council developed uh, the guidance for best environmental practices uh, for the apparel industry uh, with focus on uh, the finishing piece of fabrics because these fluorinated uh, side chain uh, telomer polymers are uh, being applied in the finishing step of textiles, which is, is fairly late in the process of, of creating uh, a tech, uh, fabric to then be turned into garments. Uh, this was published in 2014, and we have uh, different. Uh, we have this document available in different languages, for example, in, in Chinese as well. And to cho just show you a picture of what we are addressing in this document. And by the way, this is a fairly uh, high-level brief document that gives. Uh, good suggestions and, 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 and good guidance to improve the performance, and this is all done on seven pages. So it's uh, very easy to, uh, to, to look at and to understand. So what we are focusing on is, is basically this, uh, this machine here in, in textile finishes, where you have the fabric that uh, uh, then is fed into this, this machine that is called the, the, the Fullard bath, and uh, this is the the, uh, the machine where in the bottom here you have a trough uh, with this, uh, where the chemicals are, are basically waiting for the fabric to, to go through, to be immersed through. Uh, this is a water-based uh, uh, recipe that contains uh, finishing chemicals, including the water and oil repellent uh, uh, chemicals, for example. Then it then goes through rolls where excess water is being squeezed out, and then the fabric is sent through this long machine here the, uh, for drying and for curing to heat set the, uh, the, the finishing agents uh, onto the fabric so that they uh, have very good durability and, uh, and show their best performance uh, before then the, the, the fabric is wound up uh, for further uh, processing. Typically then it goes to, to cut and sew for uh, to being turned into garments. So that, that is the, the, the process here that that this document focuses on. And as you can see, this is only one piece uh, of the textile supply chain. At that stage, the, the fabric is already dyed, for example, and uh, of course there's an environmental impact for, for dyeing as well, but th this is not the focus of this document. So what, what the kernels are from, from this uh, document is clearly showing or, or indicating that when implementing and adhering to best environmental practices, it, it will help the, the textile mill, uh, but also the global community. Uh, for example, it, it will help the mill because uh, worker safety is increased. Uh, it will uh, lower or improve the impact on the surrounding and the global community because emissions uh, will be lower. Uh, resource utilization uh, will be improved. Uh, that not only includes uh, the better use or utilization of chemicals and equipment, but with that also comes uh, of less water and less electricity. So overall, by implementing that, the, the mill can reduce the operating cost. And if done correctly, it will help improve the product quality because uh, uh, if you uh, make the finishing recipe wrong or you, you finish the fabric at the wrong temperature, then you will not get the performance and the fabric often needs to be discarded and uh, you would need to start all over again. So let me show you a couple of uh, uh, details here. I don't want to uh, dig into the, the fine print here. I just want to show you in general, uh, this, the guidance that, that we developed is for, for the process that we mapped out here. It's, it's starting from, from this end going into the, into the bath into the finishing bath, then into the, into the frame here for heating and curing, and then it's being rolled up, which is not shown in this picture. But when you look at this in detail, there's only two categories in best environmental practices 
in this guidance document that, that focuses on the process itself. There's four other categories that focus on everything that needs to be done beforehand, before you actually do the finishing. And one key piece of that is training and awareness. And we will see that later on too, that this is a critical piece to, uh, uh, to work on and to focus on. But it also focuses on the correct storage and handling of the chemicals that will be used and then the proper preparation of the finishing chemical that is being used before it's then being put into the machine together with the fabric. And in, in summary, the key points are that training is key, so the, uh, the employees need to, need to be trained to be more aware of the uh, uh, environmental impact they might be creating by using these chemicals but they also need to be trained to correctly handle and use those chemicals, and that information is typically included on the safety data sheet or the technical data sheet, and oftentimes chemical suppliers help the mill to find the right recipe for finishing fabrics and help them set up uh, in, on a larger scale. And some, some things that, that uh, I would say are really making sense, but oftentimes the mills do not think about it, uh, use the product only when it's necessary to obtain the effect. Uh, so don't uh, don't use more than uh, than what is really needed. Uh, also plan on uh, how to schedule and prepare the run because, as I said, this is finishing equipment. Uh, the textile mill might not only finish uh, fabric with uh, water and oil uh, repellents, but with other with other chemistries, and if they schedule their runs accordingly, maybe they can just dedicate one full day to only running water and oil repellents, for example, and that way they would save uh, chemicals and they could uh, maybe reuse or recycle some of the leftover uh, chemicals from previous runs. And there's, there's the, uh, the topic around maintaining uh, equipment and optimizing conditions in the equipment to actually increase the product quality when it goes uh, through that equipment. And put this last, but uh, of course it's, uh, it's, I think one of the most important points is, uh, is dispose of chemicals appropriately uh, after use according to what is, uh, what is written in the safety data sheet. So th this, these are the best environmental practices for textile finishes, but let's come back to, to system change. We said BEP is integral for, for that system change, but is, is only one part. And the other important parts uh, are mentioned, uh, sorry, I need to go back here. The other important parts are, are mentioned around training, awareness, and following advice. And, and that's, that's what, we, what we're trying to focus on here in the next slide, is increasing the chemical knowledge, asking more questions around what chemicals are in the product, and what chemicals are used in the factory, and where is the product made? And those questions are, then we, we're basically leaving the textile mill at this place, and we are, somebody else is asking those questions. Right? It could be uh, us as a consumer. We want to know more about the, uh, the history of the, of the garment or the jacket that we're trying to, to, to purchase, or the brand or the retailer is asking these questions because they are now concerned say we need to understand more what kind of chemicals are being used, so they need to know more. And once they know more, they need to assess the chemicals and find criteria for which ones are, are good ones and which ones to either replace or no longer use. So there's, there's criteria for uh, restricted, restricted uh, lists, and uh, there is uh, criteria for chemicals to use, so there's preferred lists. Uh, to be used uh, to make uh, products. The mill, textile mill, will not be able to make that judgment necessarily because they don't have the, the knowledge of the chemistry. So it's somebody else or, or different players in the value chain that, uh, that will help uh, come to that conclusion and will then help uh, chemical suppliers to, to adjust accordingly and to help the mill uh, purchase the right uh, right chemicals. And the, the enablers in, in that system, and I mentioned uh, BlueSign uh, before, 
uh, are, for example, the Blue Sign System Partners. I mentioned that Floral Council member companies are, are system partners, where this company uh, assessed uh, close to 20,000 chemicals, actually, and uh, have an approval uh, system for chemicals to, to use as a preferred list, so to say, that is more than 10,000 uh, uh, products or chemicals long from more than 130 chemical suppliers. And that is, a, that is a system that is connected uh, not only with the chemical suppliers, but also with textile mills and with brands. So there you see that this is, this is one uh, company, uh, third-party certifier, that helps uh, implement the, uh, the, the system change. But the blue sign system also relies on manufacturers' restricted substances lists. It relies on best environmental practices. And it also takes information from wastewater guidelines. So it's not uh, functioning on an island, so to say, uh, by itself. But this is only one example, and there's more uh, third-party certifiers uh, uh, in the value chain. So I mentioned Blue Sign, I mentioned Ecotex, uh, there's Cradle to Cradle, uh, there's ChemIQ that is available from the VF Corporation, there's something that's called the Chemical Gateway, uh, Tox FMD, or the GOTS Positive List System. So there's, there's many different uh, third-party uh, certifiers that, that help to select preferred chemistry, and this is all then uh, enabled and, and, and tried to, uh, I would say, enabled by the Sustainable Apparel Coalition uh, it, with the help or with the initiation of the Auto Industry Association and the Zero Discharge of Hazardous Chemicals Group to help drive the system change from a brand and retailer perspective uh, through the mills, through the chemical suppliers, to improve environmental performance. And one thing to do that, to benchmark or to measure that, is uh, what, was, what is called the HIG index, which is the benchmarking tool. And we're gonna, gonna focus that on that uh, as we are now going forward. Uh, I took these, uh, these slides, by the way, from uh, uh, an outdoor industry association uh, report that was recently published where they uh, looked at the uh, state of uh, sustainability in the outdoor industry. Uh, I thought it was a very interesting, interesting read. I'll show you some of the results here, but if you want more information, I, uh, I refer to the uh, OIA uh, report that is, uh, that is available uh, on the on the internet. So the, the HIG index has, uh, has three tools. One is a facility tool. This is basically for the textile mill to measure environmental and social sustainability impacts that is being created during the manufacturing uh, process in each facility. So the, the retailer can, can give that tool uh, to their suppliers and say, please uh, fill this out and, and let us know uh, where you are uh, in, on your a continuous improvement path to more sustainable uh, production. Uh, the brand and retailers themselves uh, can do that and assess, uh, for example, uh, product life cycles or environmental performance and social impacts in their entire value chain. So floating that up and looking at much broader aspects than just uh, the, the manufacturing piece uh, of, uh, of apparel or footwear, for example. And there's a, there's a product tool that uh, looks particularly uh, into the impacts on, on apparel, footwear, and textiles. So there's different tools available to assess how, or to benchmark first and then assess progress as, uh, as all these uh, different aspects work together to create the system change. And OIA published uh, uh, data in their report. Uh, they had results from uh, 58 of their of their members that included uh, data from 850 different facilities uh, on uh, benchmarking and I guess now progressing on, on HIG index uh, in, these, uh, in these categories. And you see the, the orange bars are the responses for 2015 and the teal colored bars are the responses for 2016. And by looking at the different categories, and we don't need to look into, into those in detail, just look at the categories, we see improvement in every single category, which is great. So we said we have benchmark data, and we see that 
things are improving, but the score is 100. And you, you can see that uh, some are close to 50 and others are, are, are far away from, from 100, so to say. And, and from that, one can conclude that uh, things are improving, but there's still room for improvement and uh, we are on a way uh, to improve and as, as time will, as the years will progress, we will get better and better uh, at that to uh, hopefully reach 100 in uh, uh, scores in, in the near future. When I looked at that, I asked myself, so why, why is that? What, what is the reason or what, what is one reason or multiple reasons for, for that? And I, I found a report here from the China Water Risk Organization. They published a report in 2017 where they did a survey of uh, textile manufacturers in China. Uh, those actually represent roughly three quarters of the synthetic fiber production in China in 2015. And they asked them questions around what are the challenges that you see, what gives us insight on the challenges for improving the water quality and environmental performance of your, of your facilities. And this is the, the data that, that came from that report. I, I highlighted a couple of areas here. Let me walk you through that, that slide. So they asked what are the, there's different categories here and tell us whether those are big challenges for you, small challenges, no challenge, or you're just neutral on this. And they sorted the different categories by big challenges, of which big challenge scored, scored highest and then uh, to the lowest. And when you look at, at the first, I just picked out randomly the first seven categories here, you see that four of them are chemical related and two of them are wastewater related. And, and the biggest challenge for them was use substitute chemicals and reduce wastewater discharge. Right? When you look at that, when you take the two challenges together, it reached more than 50%. Others reached also 50%. Chemicals, which is more general, and wastewater. So you, you can still see that for those facilities, uh, this was still a challenge to, to implement the change. I think they are aware of the system change that uh, we, they want to be different. They, they, they have help from, from many players in the value chain, but it's still, still a challenge. And if we dig one level down and say, so what are the most challenging chemicals and compounds that, that you're dealing with that, uh, that pose a challenge and risk to you? Again, this is, this is sorted here by from very challenging to least challenging. You see that it's quite a, quite a long list here of, of substances that pose a challenge, and uh, the fluorinated substances are also in this, in this uh, graph. So you can see that uh, our industry has, uh, has room for improvement, but there's other, other chemistries as well that, uh, that are on this list. And then the, lastly, they ask, so what, what, what would need to change to help them improve better, or to improve their performance? And they created the wish list to brands and industry. Again, this is uh, took this copied out of this out of the report. They say that we need more training. Again, I come back. This was one of the key points early on in best environmental practices too. Is you need to have training and awareness. So you need to ensure that people are unable to to use what you're trying to implement. And they say we need help with sourcing the right chemicals. So I think that's that's a call to action for the chemical industry actually to say if you have substances that are on the positive list, make sure that those get to the right places and help engage with the textile mills so that they can implement these, these better alternatives or safer alternatives uh, more easily. Also, there's two other categories here on transparency and, and unified criteria, which is more, I would say, brand and retailer specific, where uh, oftentimes the, the criteria are not harmonized along the, the textile value chain and different brands or retailers are asking different requirements and that the textile mills are often uh, confused or it takes a lot of resources from them to, to uh, report uh, correctly for different brands or retailers. So I think a unified approach or system change approach like the HIC index will help tremendously or is helping tremendously to unify uh, this question. So as we can see, there's not one specific tool that, that will make the difference. There is a whole different 
it's a whole mixed bag of things that all need to need to fit uh, together. You can I put my email address up. You can you can get in touch with me. Uh, I'm also on the distribution list for uh, uh, for this group, so you can always get in touch with me and, and reach out if you have questions, or you can you can uh, connect with uh, with the Flora Council if you like. Either go to Flora Council's website or reach out to Jessica Bowman uh, directly. Thank you very much, uh, Kai, for this uh, presentation today on uh, behalf of the Floro Council. And uh, I'd also like to thank all the uh, participants for calling in today. And um, there'll be further information, as I mentioned in the, the, the beginning of the webinar, um, on uh, another webinar that we'll have on the 30th of uh, October that I uh, encourage you to also uh, register for. And um, as I mentioned in the beginning, too, if you have ideas about further webinars uh, that could be done in the context of the OECD UNEP Global PFC Group, and either on shifting to safer alternatives or sharing information on uh, risk management uh, approaches and best practices, I encourage you to get in contact uh, with the Secretariat. So um, with that, I'll end the call today, and uh, thank you all for your participation.